Theory of Colors is a book by Johann Wolfgang von Goethe about the poet's views on the nature of colors and how these are perceived by humans. Published in 1810, it contains detailed descriptions of phenomena such as colored shadows, refraction, and chromatic aberration. The work originated in Goethe's occupation with painting and mainly exerted an influence onto the arts. Although Goethe's work was rejected by physicists, a number of philosophers and physicists have concerned themselves with it, including Thomas Johann C. Beck, Arthur Schopenhauer, Hermann von Helmholtz, Rudolf Steiner, Ludwig Wittgenstein, Werner Heisenberg, Kurt Gar Paragraph Dell, and Mitchell Fergenbaum. Goethe's book provides a catalogue of how color is perceived in a wide variety of circumstances, and considers Isaac Newton's observations to be special cases. Unlike Newton, Goethe's concern was not so much with the analytic treatment of color, as with the qualities of how phenomena are perceived. Philosophers have come to understand the distinction between the optical spectrum, as observed by Newton, and the phenomenon of human color perception as presented by Goethe Euro a subject analyzed at length by Wittgenstein in his exegesis of Goethe in Remarks on Color. Historical Background At Goethe's time, it was generally acknowledged that, as Isaac Newton had shown in his Optics in 1704, colorless light is split up into its component colors when directed through a prism. Along with the rest of the world I was convinced that all the colors are contained in the light. No one had ever told me anything different, and I had never found the least cause to doubt it, because I had no further interest in the subject. But how I was astonished, as I looked at a white wall through the prism, that it stayed white. But only where it came upon some darkened area, it showed some color, then at last, around the window sill all the colors shone. It didn't take long before I knew here was something significant about color to be brought forth, and I spoke as through an instinct out loud, that the Newtonian teachings were false. Goethe's starting point was the supposed discovery of how Newton erred in the prismatic experiment, and by 1793 Goethe had formulated his arguments against Newton in the essay Aber Newton's Hypothes der diversen Refrangibilität to Currency T. Yet, by 1794, Goethe had begun to increasingly note the importance of the physiological aspect of colors. As Goethe notes in the historical section, Louis Bertrand Castell had already published a criticism of Newton's spectral description of prismatic color in 1740 in which he observed that the sequence of colors split by a prism depended on the distance from the prism a euro, and that Newton was looking at a special case. Whereas Newton observed the color spectrum cast on a wall at a fixed distance away from the prism, Goethe observed the cast spectrum on a white card which was progressively moved away from the prism. As the card was moved away, the projected image elongated, gradually assuming an elliptical shape, and the colored images became larger, finally merging at the center to produce green. Moving the card farther led to the increase in the size of the image, until finally the spectrum described by Newton in the optics was produced. The image cast by the refracted beam was not fixed, but rather developed with increasing distance from the prism. Consequently, Goethe saw the particular distance chosen by Newton to prove the second proposition of the optics as capriciously imposed. The theory we set up against this begins with colorless light, and avails itself of outward conditions, to produce colored phenomena. But it concedes worth and dignity to these conditions. It does not arrogate to itself developing colors from the light, but rather seeks to prove by numberless cases that color is produced by light as well as by what stands against it. In the preface to the theory of colors, Goethe explained that he tried to apply the principle of polarity, in the work a euro a proposition that belonged to his earliest convictions and was constitutive of his entire study of nature. Goethe's theory Goethe's theory of the origin of the spectrum isn't a theory of its origin that has proved unsatisfactory. It is really not a theory at all. Nothing can be predicted by means of it. It is, rather, a vague schematic outline, of the sort we find in James's psychology. There is no experimentum crucis for Goethe's theory of color. It is hard to present Goethe's theory, since he refrains from setting up any actual theory. He says, its intention is to portray rather than explain. Instead of setting up models and explanations, 
Gertner collected specimens a euro he was responsible for the meteorological collections of Gina University. By the time of his death, he had amassed over 17,800 minerals in his personal collection a euro the largest in all of Europe. He took the same approach to color a euro instead of narrowing and isolating things to a single experimentum crucius, he sought to gain as much breadth for his understanding as possible by developing a wide range of interrogations through which he would reveal the essential character of color a euro without having to resort to explanations and theories about perceived phenomena such as wavelengths or particles. The crux of his color theory is its experiential source, rather than impose theoretical statements. Goethe sought to allow light and color to be displayed in an ordered series of experiments that readers could experience for themselves. According to Goethe, Newton's error was trusting math over the sensations of his eye. To stay true to the perception without resort to explanation was the essence of Goethe's method. What he provided was really not so much a theory, as a rational description of color. For Goethe, the highest is to understand that all fact is really theory. The blue of the sky reveals to us the basic law of color. Search nothing beyond the phenomena, they themselves are the theory. Goethe delivered in full measure what was promised by the title of his excellent work, Data for a Theory of Color. They are important, complete, and significant data, rich material for a future theory of color. He has not, however, undertaken to furnish the theory itself. Hence, as he himself remarks and admits on page XXXIX of the introduction, he has not furnished us with a real explanation of the essential nature of color, but really postulates it as a phenomenon, and merely tells us how it originates, not what it is. The physiological colors. He represents as a phenomenon, complete and existing by itself, without even attempting to show their relation to the physical colors, his principal theme. It is really a systematic presentation of facts, but it stops short at this. Goethe outlines his method in the essay, The Experiment as Mediator Between Subject and Object. It underscores his experiential standpoint. The human being himself, to the extent that he makes sound use of his senses, is the most exact physical apparatus that can exist. Light and darkness, unlike his contemporaries, Goethe didn't see darkness as an absence of light, but rather as polar to and interacting with light. Color resulted from this interaction of light and shadow. For Goethe, light is the simplest most undivided most homogeneous being that we know. Confronting it is the darkness. They maintain that shade is a part of light. It sounds absurd when I express it. But so it is, for they said that colors, which are shadow and the result of shade, a light itself. Based on his experiments with turbid media, Goethe characterized color as arising from the dynamic interplay of darkness and light. Rudolf Steiner, the science editor for the Kirchner edition of Goethe's works, gave the following analogy. Modern natural science sees darkness as a complete nothingness. According to this view, the light which streams into a dark space has no resistance from the darkness to overcome. Goethe pictures to himself that light and darkness relate to each other like the north and south pole of a magnet. The darkness can weaken the light in its working power. Conversely, the light can limit the energy of the darkness. In both cases color arises. Goethe expresses this more succinctly. Yellow is a light which has been dampened by darkness. Blue is a darkness weakened by light. Experiments with turbid media. The action of turbid media was to go to the ultimate fact a euro the urba currency nomen a euro of the world of colors. Goethe's studies of color began with experiments which examined the effects of turbid media, such as air, dust, and moisture on the perception of light and dark. The poet observed that light seen through a turbid medium appears yellow, and darkness seen through an illuminated medium appears blue. The highest degree of light, such as that of the sun is for the most part colorless. This light, however, seen through a medium but very slightly thickened, appears to us yellow. If the density of such a medium be increased, or if its volume become greater, we shall see the light gradually assume a yellow-red hue, which at last deepens to a ruby color. If on the other hand darkness is seen through a semi-transparent medium, 
which is itself illumined by a light striking on it, a blue color appears, this becomes lighter and paler as the density of the medium is increased, but on the contrary appears darker and deeper the more transparent the medium becomes, in the least degree of dimness short of absolute transparency, always supposing a perfectly colorless medium, this deep blue approaches the most beautiful violet. He then proceeds with numerous experiments, systematically observing the effects of rarefied mediums such as dust, air, and moisture on the perception of color. Boundary conditions. When viewed through a prism, the orientation of a light euro dark boundary with respect to the prism's axis is significant. With white above a dark boundary, we observe the light extending a blue violet edge into the dark area. Whereas dark above a light boundary results in a red yellow edge extending into the light area. Goethe was intrigued by this difference. He felt that this arising of color at light to euro dark boundaries was fundamental to the creation of the spectrum. Varying the experimental conditions by using different shades of gray shows that the intensity of colored edges increases with boundary contrast. Light and dark spectra. Since the color phenomenon relies on the adjacency of light and dark, there are two ways to produce a spectrum, with a light beam in a dark room, and with a dark beam in a light room. Gertner recorded the sequence of colors projected at various distances from a prism for both cases. In both cases, he found that the yellow and blue edges remain closest to the side which is light, and red and violet edges remain closest to the side which is dark. At a certain distance, these edges overlap a euro, and we obtain Newton's spectrum. When these edges overlap in a light spectrum, green results. When they overlap in a dark spectrum, magenta results. With a light spectrum, we find yellow-red colors along the top edge, and blue-violet colors along the bottom edge. The spectrum with green in the middle arises only where the blue-violet edges overlap the yellow-red edges. With a dark spectrum, we find violet blue along the top edge, and red yellow along the bottom edge a euro, and where these edges overlap, we find magenta. Goethe's color wheel. When the eye sees a color it is immediately excited and it is its nature, spontaneously and of necessity, at once to produce another, which with the original color, comprehends the whole chromatic scale. Goethe anticipated Ewald Herring's opponent process theory by proposing a symmetric color wheel. He writes, the chromatic circle is arranged in a general way according to the natural order. For the colors diametrically opposed to each other in this diagram are those which reciprocally evoke each other in the eye. Thus, yellow demands violet. Orange demands blue. Purple demands green. And vice versa, thus. All intermediate gradations reciprocally evoke each other. The simpler color demanding the compound, and vice versa. In the same way that light and dark spectra yielded green from the mixture of blue and yellow a euro Goethe completed his color wheel by recognizing the importance of non-spectral colors a euro for Newton, only spectral colors could count as fundamental. By contrast, Goethe's more empirical approach led him to recognize the essential role of magenta in a complete color circle, a role that it still has in all modern color systems. Complementary colors and color psychology. Goethe also included aesthetic qualities in his color wheel, under the title of allegorical, symbolic, mystic use of color, establishing a kind of color psychology. He associated red with the beautiful, orange with the noble, yellow to the good, green to the useful, blue to the common, and violet to the unnecessary. These six qualities were assigned to four categories of human cognition the rational to the beautiful and the noble, the intellectual to the good and the useful, the sensual to the useful and the common and, closing the circle, imagination to both the unnecessary and the beautiful. Notes on translation, magenta appeared as a color term only in mid-19th century, after Goethe. Hence, references to Goethe's recognition of magenta are fraught with interpretation. If one observes the colors coming out of the prism a euro an English person may be more inclined to describe as magenta a euro, what in German is called purple a euro so one may not lose the intention of the author. However, literal translation is more difficult. Goethe's work uses two composite words for mixed hues along with corresponding usual color terms such as orange, and violet. 
it is not clear how Gertner's rot, purpur, and chaparagraph N are related between themselves and to the red tip of the visible spectrum. The text about interference from the physical chapter does not consider rot and purpur synonymous. Also, purpur is certainly distinct from blorot, because purpur is named as a color which lies somewhere between blorot and gel brot, although possibly not adjacent to the latter. This article uses the English translations from the above table. Newton and Goethe, the essential difference between Goethe Euro unregistered trademark S theory of color and the theory which has prevailed in science since Newton Euro unregistered trademark S day, lies in this, while the theory of Newton and his successors was based on excluding the color seeing faculty of the eye, Goethe founded his theory on the IE Euro unregistered trademark S experience of color. The renouncing of life and immediacy, which was the premise for the progress of natural science since Newton, formed the real basis for the bitter struggle which Goethe waged against the physical optics of Newton. It would be superficial to dismiss this struggle as unimportant, there is much significance in one of the most outstanding men directing all his efforts to fighting against the development of Newtonian optics. Due to their different approaches to a common subject, Many misunderstandings have arisen between Newton's mathematical understanding of optics, and Goethe's experiential approach. Because Newton understands white light to be composed of individual colors, and Goethe sees color arising from the interaction of light and dark, they come to different conclusions on the question, is the optical spectrum a primary or a compound phenomenon? For Newton, the prism is immaterial to the existence of color, as all the colors already exist in white light and the prism merely fans them out according to their refrangibility. Goethe sought to show that, as a turbid medium, the prism was an integral factor in the arising of color. Whereas Newton narrowed the beam of light in order to isolate the phenomenon, Goethe observed that with a wider aperture, there was no spectrum. He saw only reddish-yellow edges and blue-cyan edges with white between them, and the spectrum arose only where these edges came close enough to overlap. For him, the spectrum could be explained by the simpler phenomena of color arising from the interaction of light and dark edges. Newton explains the appearance of white with colored edges by saying that due to the differing overall amount of refraction, the rays mix together to create a full white towards the center, whereas the edges do not benefit from this full mixture and appear with greater red or blue components. For Newton's account of his experiments, see his optics. Table of Differences Goethe's reification of darkness is rejected by modern physics. Both Newton and Huygens define darkness as an absence of light. Young and Fresnel combined Newton's particle theory with Huygens' wave theory to show that color is the visible manifestation of light's wavelength. Physicists today attribute both a corpuscular and undulatory character to light a euro comprising the wave a euro particle duality. History and Influence the first edition of the Farbenloo was printed at the Kotara Euro unregistered trademark Schenverlag's Butch Handlung on May 16, 1810, with 250 copies on grey paper and 500 copies on white paper. It contained three sections, I, A or didactic section in which Goethe presents his own observations, E, an or polemic section in which he makes his case against Newton, and E, an or historical section. From its publication, the book was controversial for its stance against Newton. So much so, that when Charles Eastlake translated the text into English in 1840, he omitted the content of Goethe's polemic against Newton. Significantly, only the didactic color observations appear in Eastlake's translation. In his preface, Eastlake explains that he deleted the historical and entoptic parts of the book because they lacked scientific interest and censored Goethe's polemic because the violence of his objections against Newton would prevent readers from fairly judging Goethe's color observations. Influence on the arts Goethe was initially induced to occupy himself with the study of color by the questions of hue and painting. During his first journey to Italy, he noticed that artists were able to enunciate rules for virtually all the elements of painting and drawing except color and coloring. In the year 1786 Euro 88, Goethe began investigating whether one could ascertain rules to govern the artistic use of color. The same came to some fulfillment when several pictorial artists, above all Philip Otto Runge, took an interest in his color studies. 
After being translated into English by Charles Eastlake in 1840, the theory became widely adopted by the art world a Euro especially among the pre rap halites. J. Emma W. Turner studied it comprehensively and referenced it in the titles of several paintings. Wassily Kandinsky considered it one of the most important works. Influence on Latin American flags During a party in Aymar in the winter of 1785, Goethe had a late-night conversation on his theory of primary colors with the South American revolutionary Francisco de Miranda. This conversation inspired Miranda, as he later recounted, in his designing the yellow, blue and red flag of Gran Colombia, from which the present national flags of Colombia, Venezuela and Ecuador are derived, influence on philosophers, in the 19th century Goethe's theory was taken up by Schopenhauer in On Vision and Colors, who developed it into a kind of arithmetical physiology of the action of the retina, much in keeping with his own representative realism. In the 20th century the theory was transmitted to philosophy via Wittgenstein, who devoted a series of remarks to the subject at the end of his life. These remarks are collected as remarks on color. Someone who agrees with Goethe finds that Goethe correctly recognized the nature of color. And here a euro naturia euro unregistered trademark does not mean a sum of experiences with respect to colors, but it is to be found in the concept of color. Wittgenstein was interested in the fact that some propositions about color are apparently neither empirical nor exactly a priori, but something in between, phenomenology, according to Goethe. However, he took the line that there is no such thing as phenomenology, though there are phenomenological problems. He was content to regard Goethe's observations as a kind of logic or geometry. Wittgenstein took his examples from the Rundschletter included in the Farbenlu, for example. White is the lightest color, there cannot be a transparent white, there cannot be a reddish green, and so on. The logical status of these propositions in Wittgenstein's investigation, including their relation to physics, was discussed in Jonathan Westfall's Color, a Philosophical Introduction. Reception by scientists, as early as 1853, in Hermann von Helmholtz's lecture on Goethe's scientific works a Euro he says of Goethe's work that he depicts the perceived phenomena a Euro circumstantially, rigorously true to nature, and vividly, puts them in an order that is pleasant to survey and proves himself here, as everywhere in the realm of the factual, to be the great master of exposition. Helmholtz ultimately rejects Goethe's theory as the work of a poet, but expresses his perplexity at how they can be in such agreement about the facts of the matter, but in violent contradiction about their meaning Euro and I for one do not know how anyone, regardless of what his views about colors are, can deny that the theory in itself is fully consequent, that its assumptions, once granted, explain the facts treated completely and indeed simply. Although the accuracy of Goethe's observations does not admit a great deal of criticism, his theory's failure to demonstrate significant predictive validity eventually rendered it scientifically irrelevant. Thomas Johann Seebeck was the only prominent scientist among Goethe's contemporaries who acknowledged the theory, but later saw it critically. Goethe's color theory has in many ways borne fruit in art physiology and aesthetics. But victory, and hence influence on the research of the following century, has been Newton's. One whole Goethe did find in Newton's armor, through which he incessantly worried the Englishman with his lance. Newton had committed himself to the doctrine that refraction without color was impossible. He therefore thought that the object glasses of telescopes must forever remain imperfect, achromatism and refraction being incompatible. This inference was proved by Delone to be wrong. Here, as elsewhere, Goethe proves himself master of the experimental conditions. It is the power of interpretation that he lacks. Much controversy stems from two different ways of investigating light and color. Goethe was not interested in Newton's analytic treatment of color a euro, but he presented an excellent rational description of the phenomenon of human color perception. It is as such a collection of color observations that we must view this book. Most of Goethe's explanations of color have been thoroughly demolished, but no criticism has been leveled at his reports of the facts to be observed. Nor should any be. This book can lead the reader through a demonstration course not only in subjectively produced colors, 
but also in physical phenomena detectable qualitatively by observation of color. A reader who attempts to follow the logic of Goethe's explanations and who attempts to compare them with the currently accepted views might, even with the advantage of 1970 sophistication, become convinced that Goethe's theory, or at least a part of it, has been dismissed too quickly. Mitchell Fergenborn came to believe that Goethe had been right about color. As Fergenborn understood them, Goethe's ideas had true science in them. They were hard and empirical. Over and over again, Goethe emphasized the repeatability of his experiments. It was the perception of color, to Goethe, that was universal and objective. What scientific evidence was there for a definable real-world quality of redness independent of our perception? Current status Goethe started out by accepting Newton's physical theory. He soon abandoned it. Finding modification to be more in keeping with his own insights. One beneficial consequence of this was that he developed an awareness of the importance of the physiological aspect of color perception, and was therefore able to demonstrate that Newton's theory of light and colors is too simplistic. That there is more to color than variable refrangibility. As a catalog of observations, Goethe's experiments probe the complexities of human color perception. Whereas Newton sought to develop a mathematical model for the behavior of light, Goethe focused on exploring how color is perceived in a wide array of conditions. Developments in understanding how the brain interprets colors, such as color constancy and Edwin H. Lanz Rattier next theory bear striking similarities to Goethe's theory. A modern treatment of the book is given by Dennis L. Seppo in the book, Goethe contra Newton, Polemics in the Project for a New Science of Color. Quotations. See also, Theory of Painting, Check a Shadow Illusion, Color Theory, Notes and References. Bibliography, Goethe, Theory of Colors, Trans. Charles Locke Eastlake, Cambridge, Massachusetts, MIT Press, 1982. ISBN 0-262-57021-1, Bokamool, M. Turner. Colm, Tashin. 1991. ISBN 3-8228-6325-4. Duck, Michael, A Euro Oe Newton and Goethe on Color, Physical and Physiological Considerations A Euro, Annals of Science 45, 5, September 1988 PPA 507 A Euro 519. Glick, James, Chaos, London, William Heinemann. 1988 PPA 165 a Euro 7, Lyra, Jonah, Goethe and Color, Science Blogs, The Frontal Cortex, December 7, 2006. Luz, Ernst, Man or Matter, Chapter 14, 5, M. W. Rowe, Goethe and Wittgenstein, Philosophy, Volume 66, Number 257, PPA 283 a Euro 303, Cambridge University Press JSTOR, RIBE, Neil and Friedrich Stein, A Euro OE Exploratory Experimentation, Goethe, Land, and Color Theory A Euro, Physics Today 55, 7, July 2002. Proskua, The Rediscovery of Color, Dornich, Steiner Books, 1986. Schopenhauer, On Vision and Colors, Providence, Berg, 1994. ISBN 0-85496-988-8, Sepper, Dennis L., Goethe contra Newton, Polemics in the Project for a New Science of Color, Cambridge, Cambridge University Press, 2007. ISBN 0-521-53132-2, Steiner, Rudolf, First Scientific Lecture Course, Third Lecture, Stuttgart. December 25, 1919. GA 320. Steiner, Rudolf, A Euro OE Goethe's World View A Euro, Chapter 3 The Phenomena of the World of Colors, 1897. Westfall, Jonathan, Color, A Philosophical Introduction, Aristotelian Society Series, Volume 7, Oxford, Blackwell, 1991. Wittgenstein, Remarks on Color, Berkeley. University of California Press, 1978. ISBN 0-520-03727-8, External Links. 
Theory of Colors, Theory of Colors, Theory of Colors, Physics Today Our Euro Exploratory Experimentation, Goethe, Land, and Color Theory, 2002, Goethe's Prismatic Experiments. The Toast by Cicada Jima, Light, Darkness and Color, a film by Henrik Boerschras, Connections that have a quality of necessity, Goethe's Way of Science as a Phenomenology of Nature, Color Mixing and Goethe's Triangle, Texts on Wikisers, John Tyndall, A Euro OE Goethe's Farbenloo, Theory of Colors, I, A Euro in Popular Science Monthly, Volume 17, June 1880. John Tyndall, A Euro OE Goethe's Farbenloo, Theory of Colors, 2, A Euro in Popular Science Monthly, Volume 17, July 1880. BBC Radio 4 Podcast, In Our Time Science, Goethe and the Science of the Enlightenment, or this link, 6, Critical Review of Goethe's Theory of Colors, A List of Links Relating to Goethe's Investigation of Color, Essay Discussing Color Psychology and Goethe's Theory, Google Scholar, Works Citing Theory of Colors.